Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is Debbie Levitt from Delta CX. We're a full service CX and UX consultancy. We do projects, training, and consulting. Check us out at the new customercentricity.com website. Um, quick note, we're supposed to have Dr. Nick joining today and he hasn't showed up today, so I will have to go it alone until he can join. I haven't heard from him, hopefully he'll be here soon. So we will just uh, do what we can until he gets here. As always, I want to thank everybody who's donating to the channel, past, present, and future. I, I finally updated this yesterday. They don't make it easy. Um, thanks to everybody who has pressed join on the YouTube channel and uh, is giving 3 to $10 per month, which keeps me in streaming software and chocolate chips. I just wiped some chocolate off my mouth before this show started, so if you see chocolate on me, won't you please be a friend and say something? I would want to know. I do want to hear your butt looks fat in that, if it does. Hello, Ana Lucia. Um, so, um, what else can I tell you? Oh, um, if Nick's not here, uh, seems fine. Thank you. There's chocolate on me. Do let me know. Done what I can. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump into our questions. Um, I'm also going to just do a quick change around of my equipment here and just tr um, take out my Bluetooth earbuds because there's no reason to wear them if Nick isn't talking in my head. Hopefully he will be soon. All right. Um, again, I'm using my new microphone. If it doesn't sound right or you can't hear me, let me know. Some of you complained about the sound of the heater, so let me turn that off. Um, but again, remember, this is Office Hours Ask Me Anything. You can put your question in the chat room, which I'm watching, or you can uh, go to deltacx.com slash links and put your question there, and I'll get it anonymously. Hello, Irena and letter S. Um, so nice to be wearing a wireless mic where I can walk across the room and turn the heater off. So for those of you who don't like to hear the sound of the heater, yay, wireless mic. I'm really enjoying them. Not sponsored. Uh, not sponsored sponsored wireless mic, uh, but really enjoying them. Okay, um, so let's talk about our first question, which is a long one. No, I don't expect anybody to be able to read that, but I always promise I'll put them up on the screen. And I'm keeping that promise, but it's a bit of a long story, as we do get from time to time, but we welcome these. Um, okay, S has a question. I'll put your question at the end. We had some people send in their questions ahead of time, which you can do using the anonymous link on deltacx.link, uh, sorry, deltacx.com slash link. So I am going to work through those first and then we'll get to S. Thank you, S. Okay, so long question says, everybody get ready to give me your comments and answers. You can join in. This says, um, also, let me see. I'm I'm watching for Dr. Nick in case he joins. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, nope, haven't heard from him yet. Well, I will keep watching. Hi, Debbie. I haven't had the chance to join the live session, so I'll ask here. I'm designing an enterprise web app, so the paying customers are not the actual end users. While talking about customer centricity, I realized. I'm thinking about different people from our C-suite, and I generally think that many designs I came up with do not help the business goals, depending on how much the paying customers care about the actual users. The current strategy is to get this product out, and it's okay if we only hit 60% of the user needs. Who decided that? Definitely not the user. Other reasons for this strategy, I think, are, one, this web app is built on a data system that's the IP of the company, so the data itself is a big selling point. Two, because of this, oh, Nick says he's uh, on his way, so I'll get my headphones ready. Two, because of this IP, this company sits very well on the market and pretty much has no competitors. And three, the company is still short on money and needs to push the product to market to bring money in. It has its IP, but it's a niche market right now. Four, this company has been doing business with the paying customers for years, so they know or they think they know exactly where's the pain point and what's the selling point. Five, in the words of our C-suite, we're building a product that not many people know they need yet. My question is, from my heart, I think I need to do more research with the actual end users to inform the design, but I don't know how to challenge this product strategy. 
on page 10 of your new book, you briefly touched on this in the We Know What Customers Want subchapter. All four questions you are suggesting are challenging the quality of their knowledge. But with that, it's okay if we hit only 60% of the user needs in the first MVP and we can fix it later attitude. Those questions don't work. It's like they want to sell a book, their IP data, and don't care that much about how the book is laid out. Thank you so much and apologies for such a long question. So ultimately, and we'll get Ana Lucia's question on the list after S, um, ultimately, <clears throat> it sounds like we have a question here about quality. Oh, and I see an anonymous question coming in as well, so please hold on. Uh, let's get anonymous question added about the high level position. Okay, so this is obviously a complicated question and we're talking about making change and we're talking about people who have pre-decided that, hi Albina, have pre-decided that it, quality doesn't totally matter. So I, first of all, you may not be able to make change. Just remember that, you saw that in the book. Not everybody who wants to make change can make change. You may not be able to convince these people uh, to care, especially when companies don't have competitors or they don't have strong competition. They often feel like we're going to be the best thing out there. So who cares? There's a lot of who cares and there's a lot of it's good enough. So, you know, what do you think you should do? Hypothetically, if you get to pick, yes, you should be, uh, uh, oop, let's add Dr. Nick if he's ready to be, uh, no, not he's ready. Okay. Uh, hold on. Hi. Hello, hello. Very, very sorry. How are you guys? Don't worry about it. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. I was actually asleep. I've had a really heavy, big day. I just mapped a massive IA and it really knacked, knacked me. Sorry. Apologies. No, um, it's fine. Good to have you at all. Or you can go back to sleep. No, no, this is good. I'd much rather be with you guys. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. We started with a question so long. I'm not going to repeat it because it looks like this. So forget about it. It's a very <laughs> long story, but the gist of the story was um, it's an enterprise web app. There's a lot of um, uh, IP that the company has. A lot of the data seems to be very proprietary. The company really doesn't have many competitors. So the C-suite and others kind of don't care whether or not they're meeting user needs. Um, they're probably going to be good enough and they don't have strong competition. The person asking thinks they should be doing more research with the end user's needs, but how do you make change in an organization who seems to feel like eh, it's good enough if we meet 60% of users' needs and we'll fix it later? Nick, what are your thoughts on the short version of that question? The short version of that question, that sounds like every CMS I've ever worked with, you know, uh, every proprietary CMS, every agency in the kind of mid or late, you know, in the, in the teens basically created. Um, and they did it for the same reasons that you've just said, they, because they can. Mm -hmm. um, the way to I would try to sell them on this is is selling more seats, more licenses. You know, getting this software used more um, if it's more usable. If you know what I mean, if it's your useful, if it's meeting needs, if it's not a pain in the neck to use, all of that stuff. I'm sure that Debbie's probably said something almost identical to me before I joined. I was so busy reading the question, I barely got to the answer. It was a long question. <laughs> okay, so yeah, something along those lines. You know, um, otherwise. If they're hell bent on doing things this way, I'd, I'd actually start looking for work because, you know, they're making their money, they're very happy, but you've got your UX career ahead of you. And if the two don't really align, they're, they're running in parallel, they're not crossing. And so you need to get your experience somewhere else, I would say, because they're not really playing the game because they don't really need to. And I like what Shweta is saying in the chat. She says, you can make a case with business KPIs, but it's like pushing a boulder up a hill if you have to keep making a case. Um, hello, Madeline. So uh, that's, Shweta makes an interesting point. Could you at least speak to someone or slightly battle for there being some customer-centric KPIs for the user. Sure, you might be able to sell this to, because usually in enterprise you have the people who buy it and you have the people who use it. So, you know, sure we can probably sell this, but what about the people who use it? Um, and I always want to look at more than 
time in the system or number of logins. You know, we're going to have to do something that looks at more than this, whether it's task time. Some people love NPS. I don't like it, but very often executives in the C-suite do like it. I tell people if you are going to use some any of these satisfaction surveys or systems, at least pair it with the question of why. Okay, we got a score of this. Do we know why? We got thumbs down all over the place. Do we know why? Let's spin up more research to learn where this is going well or not. You might want to do some evaluative testing and watch people use the system and see where there's room for improvement. Um, John says, good business goals should help guide UX goals, not the other way around. Um, and Ana Lucia says, it sounds like my former job. They didn't even think they needed research. They were like, we know what our clients need. I don't even know where they're where they got the confidence. Nick, anything else to add? I would do this sounds like a perfect go rogue opportunity if you can do it, you know, within the boundaries of getting fired. Um, not you know what I mean, without getting fired, basically. Um, you, you don't get fired, but you need them to do some good work on their behalf because they don't know, know that they need you to do it. <clears throat> and that is the case, you know, is, is the conditions to going rogue. But you've got to be very careful with that. That's one of Dr. Nick's go-tos. So if you want to know more about going rogue, you can look him up on the LinkedIn and, and ask him. Um, okay, I see a question coming in from Irena. Irena, we already have a long list. I'll get you at the end of that. I'm going to jump in with the next question. These came in ahead of time, and that's why they've got priority. So just remember, everybody, if you want to be one of the first questions answered, please send it in ahead of time. This one says... Um, hi, Debbie. Curious to know if you've ever heard of CCXP certification from the Customer Experience Professional Association. I see some people in my company have it and are not sure if it's good. I do see design thinking by IDEO on their recommended reading list. Um, Nick, before I go nuclear, do you have any thoughts on CCXP certification? I, I hadn't actually heard of it until you just mentioned it. I've never in my 12 or 13 years of practice in UX come across anybody with that certification on my travels. So that's just my perspective. Maybe it's amazing. Maybe I've been living in a locker somewhere. Um, I'm really, 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 I've seen lots of these certification programs popping up, shiny certificates, which they downloaded a template in Canva to produce uh, that looked really official, that gave you that sense of completion. But what's about the validity of the information that you're being taught? And I'm going to hand over now to Debbie to absolutely smash the design thinking part. Well, I can actually smash all of it. So, um, and Shweta wants to add to her question, and I have to figure out which one was even her question. So, uh, oh, a question that challenges me. Everybody knows I'm in copy paste hell. I don't know why y'all do this to me. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to, Shweta, I'm adding to your question. This is not easy, y'all. Um, and John, you're asking about an opportunity for soft skills. I don't know to what. Um, uh, and Shweta is still adding to her question. So, oh my gosh. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do my best here, everybody. Thank you for your thoughts and prayers as I copy and paste. Okay, so here's what happened. I tried to do the CCXP late last year thinking, ah, more certificates, more letters after my name. Somebody will care, right? I didn't make it through the first hour of the course. Um, I found it so terrible and so outdated and so not about customer centricity that I asked for a refund. And the people who were offering it were actually quite lovely and they said, you know, we've looked you up and we kind of know who you are and we don't know why you're here. And, you know, we don't think you're going to like this course. And yeah, the materials need to be updated. I said, gee, I just thought, you know, more letters after my name, someone will care. And they're like, no, you kind of shouldn't be here. We'll happily give all your money back. And we look forward to buying your book when it's out. So um, the idea of having UX design influence business goals. I, I don't even remember when we talked about that. Um, so anyway, here's, uh, and, and considering I just dropped, last week I just dropped out of a shitty, insulting, terrible service design course um, wh where they refused to refund me and I'm now working with American Express on that, um, not sponsored. 
Um, here's the here's kind of what I've come to on all of these certifications and, and things. And we di I even did this a couple of years ago on the channel. I said, what's the value of UX training? Here's the bottom line. Do UX training or certification for one or both of two reasons, and pretty much only these. Do you live in a region or country that thinks certifications are the freaking bomb and it will absolutely get you a job if you have one of these on your CV? We know that there are countries and regions, some people tell me India is like this, um, that if people see these certificates on your CV, they think, oh, holy cats, this person is unbelievable and stands out. So if you live somewhere where these matter, then you might want to do it even when the course sucks. Um, since most of my work has been America and Europe, I've never had someone say to me, we like you, but you didn't get a CCXP. Or we like you, but you're not a Nielsen Norman Group master. No one has ever... <coughs> excuse me, lingering COVID cough. No one has ever closed a door on me because I didn't have these. And depending upon where you live, they might not close the door on you. That's one reason to do these. Number two, are they teaching something that you need to learn and you can't learn it better somewhere else? So CCXP, I'm convinced you can learn that better somewhere else. The terrible service design class I was just in, I'm convinced you can learn that better somewhere else. Where, I'm not totally sure, maybe maybe my book for the CCXP one and service design, I don't even know, uh, Ricardo from SCAD in America. But ultimately, if, if you aren't gonna learn what you wanna learn, which was our experience in certainly the service design class, uh, don't bother. I can't tell, I want to do a show on how many courses I've dropped out of in the last few years. I dropped out of you an should. NNG, I dropped out of an NNG and got an immediate refund when I complained. I dropped out of, oh, I hated the behavioral science one from, what's their names, who claimed to be the best at behavioral science. They had a terrible course that was not worth the money and I paid it. I, I have a list at this point and yeah, Melanie says, you totally should. Um, so I'm at the point where if you don't live in an area where people really give a crap about these certifications and if the content is not going to help you, like for example, if Dr. Nick gave a course, the content is going to help you. Whether or not people recognize his certificate of completion or whatever, the, the content's going to help you. It's worth it. So this is how I judge this shit. Dr. Nick, I'm mad today. The reason why there is so much bad in the world, this, I'm going to call it misinformation, but we're just going to call it shitty training. Same thing, right? Because the people that are writing the training have not got any significant user experience or customer experience at all of their own. None. Um, that's the reason why. That's the reason why Debbie could write a training course tomorrow on a specific subject. Me too. Because we are practitioners. We have been practitioners with the knowledge that comes from the practice is in our heads. You can only get that knowledge from doing the practice. And everybody in the entire world today thinks you can become <coughs> as good as Debbie and I at UX by reading books and going on courses. And it's an absolute fallacy. The world wants you to believe that because you've got a massive appetite for learning and development right now, and they want to sell something but they haven't got the resource that's in our heads that we've learned that Debbie and I and everybody else. And that's the problem here. And this is why on LinkedIn, I'm being really, I'm turning the volume up on it. People like Debbie and I should be in senior leadership positions in major brands. I'm not sure I actually want to be, but they should be begging us to go to those places, begging us and paying us huge sums of money, which I would love to turn down. <laughs> but the point being is, in order to get this billion pound, trillion pound global transformation, to get everybody back into profitability where they want to be, needs knowledge transfer. And that knowledge transfer doesn't come from books because those books are created by people who weren't practitioners. Kind of ranty, but really important to say. I like it. Unless, of course, it's my book. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Debbie's book, blah, blah, blah. Yeah.
<clears throat> yeah, and Ana Lucia says, I'll just say I'm jealous of the idea of valuing the experience and forgetting the certifications. There's a lot of companies here that think that cert certifications are the best thing ever, and how dare you not have the certifications? So sure, again, some of the, I've heard this about some certain countries, and you know, that's why at the end of my courses, I always give a certificate of completion to anybody who attends at least a certain percent of it, because somebody somewhere loves to see that certificate. Nick. Yeah, but please do bear in mind, everybody that's watching, at least me individually, I've got these stamps on my bum, you know, I've got a PhD and all that crap. And I, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Right now, it's good and, and it's important window dressing for me for getting gigs and stuff like that. But in my daily job, the work that I do, I'm only good because of the experience that I have, not because of my academics or courses. That's, that should give you all a lot of hope because Debbie and I have been on courses, but the, there weren't courses 10 years ago. You know, there weren't. We were inventing this stuff, basically, or learning on the fly. Well, if we can do that, so can you. The, the, the difference is, is that we can shortcut you making the mistakes that we made because we've done it already. And really, that's the great tro trouble in the world. So don't, I, don't, I wouldn't get hung up on certifications because everybody else is going crazy for them. I, I would spend my time... My, like if you can get in with a genuine senior or on a team there's a genuine senior that's worth every book and every certificate on the planet bottom line agree yep and uh don't forget everybody set aside uh, mid-may for a big adventure in denver um certainly larry and i will be giving live workshops and we hope that there will be additional special guests joining us as well still to be ironed out but uh we hope that uh everyone will come fly their asses to denver and learn from me and larry live and we'll also have remote tickets as well so block your calendars this is going to be probably May 18 and 19 and possibly the 20th as well. So block it can out. I, can I just say, I don't know if Larry's on the call. Larry, if you're watching or not, I cover your ears. Um, Larry oh. Marine is a bit of a god. He's a bit of a legend of HCI and I don't think he gets anywhere near enough the kudos or respect or just recognition. The name Larry Marine I knew about before I met Debbie, before I knew it from my MSC course. Um, there's a shit ton of golden knowledge, golden people out here who have been doing this longer than Debbie and I, you know, at Xerox Park, you know, proper legends. Um, Debbie's got, Debbie's bringing, Debbie's like friends with him. <laughs> She's bringing him to Denver, making him accessible to you guys. He lives near Denver. Out, sorry, whatever, wherever it is in the world, if you know what I mean. I'm flying You're in. Mad on this stuff, mad, because... Larry's perspective might not be the one that you are interested in, but it's a critical perspective. Critical. You cannot ignore the man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got invited to do a talk uh, last year at this guy's small UX meetup. And I was like, what an odd little group. And when I asked the guy more about his history, he was like one of the first human factors engineers at Kodak. And I was yeah. like, oh, Oh my goodness. Oh, you're you're like that guy. You know, he was he's like, like he's like um like uh This Douglas, wasn't Larry Marine, like this was somebody else. And, the, yeah, but they're those guys, you know, like the yeah. original Zero guys, like the like the Norm the Don Normans and the Schneidermans of the world. And luckily they're still out there. I think this guy said he was in his early eighties or something, but he had been like one of the original human factors Kodak guys for, for decades or whatever, so yeah. Um, anyway, let's, we have so many questions waiting for us, so let's just jump in and we can talk more about these things later. So this was, um, hi Debbie, how would you conduct research on things that don't exist before? I've written an article on this and I'm doing it now at my own company. For example, how does an energy company's online self-service portal manage car sharing stations or solar panels in residential homes in the future is it needed to conduct a i know get your pen and paper out nick is it needed to conduct a competitive analysis if other cities or companies have done similar things if you were to conduct research on the actual users who haven't experienced any of this what research would you do i'm all over this nick do you want yeah. to go first i know it's a bit yeah, of a I brain hurts question it's not actually i was just trying to keep hold of the actual technologies and trying to the actual question at hand but what you're really asking is you've got a really specific technology or you know cutting edge tech type thing 
um, how do you test with people who don't have a mental model or a concept for the thing that you need to learn about? Which is pretty much the question, I think. Um, I did this when I was at a petrol company, a, a global petrol company a few years ago, uh, where we were looking at, without getting to any confidence, giving any confidences away, looking at um, how will pet petrol station properties be used in the future when people aren't using petrol as much sort of thing. Um, and it's a big question because people don't have concepts for last mile drone delivery generally and that sort of things, right? Um, so the question is, is, how do you speak to people? It's all about those needs. It, your look, I mean, in terms of, sorry, your, what was her case, the, this, the example of this one in particular? Yeah, was, this particular one was like an energy company's self-service portal for car charging and solar panels when they haven't built that yet. It's their first time making that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, this is kind of similar to the petrol station work, I think, in that you're looking at lifestyle and needs and the service journey and all of that stuff in terms of a car. So if you're running a car um, and that car doesn't run on, on petrol and therefore you have to charge it somewhere, what does that mean? What is your life? What is the what how what is your behavior that's going to require refueling? And then how does how does that go? Mm -hmm. So you looking at, looking at the as is and then looking at how that might impact the to be. Something in that realm is exactly what I did at BP. Not BP, sorry, Shell. Yeah, um, uh, yes to that. So basically, so the part of the question was, should I be doing a competitive analysis? Larry Marine would say, warning, danger. A lot of times when you do a competitive analysis, you end up just wanting to copy the competitor, but you're assuming that the competitor did it right, and you're assuming that the competitor isn't right now fixing their mistakes or building the next great thing. So you'll always be chasing them. So you can do a competitive analysis just to be aware of what's out there, but be careful not to let that uh, influence copying them. Use it as domain knowledge, not as a reason to copy them. Nick is totally right. I would be doing observational and interview style research with the people who have these electric cars or because you talked about, uh, what was it, charging uh, car charging stations and solar panels in residential homes. Does anybody in your area currently have these? Somebody must have an electric car. Somebody must have put solar panels on. Maybe it's zero, but somebody's probably done this. Can you find these people and learn how are they doing this now? Check out our videos in the uh, YouTube channel, Delta CX Micro Lessons, and look for all the task analysis videos. <clears throat> how do people do this now? And what's going well? What could be improved? These are the things you want to know because your company wants to build the better mousetrap. Do they, now you're saying, oh, but this is an app for them to manage this portal. The, the, you have to look at what's going on in their task, how they do their task and how they respond to their task and where they band-aid their task might tell you some of what should be in a portal. I'm not even convinced anyone needs the portal. I mean, are they just looking at their electric bill? Are you telling them how much they saved by having solar panels or an electric car? Uh, you know, what's the portal for? And Larry Marine, who talks a lot about dashboard design, reminds you, don't just give people pretty charts. Make sure if you're building a dashboard or a portal that there's action they can take, that there's some sort of advice or information or action they can take. Otherwise, it's pretty charts. Um, and Solomon says, if the thing doesn't exist yet, how do you have competitors? OK, that's a good critical thinking question. Melanie Levy says, exactly. You may find out a portal isn't the right solution for the problem. Yeah, what, do, what are people trying to do and what do they need? It might not be a portal. Or it might just be a simple screen or something you add to their existing account with you. I I'm not sold on, I'm not, I'm, remember, at that point in research, you should be solution agnostic. You don't know what the answer is. You're answering unanswered questions. Nick. Yeah, but ask the product manager what their intention is. Like what this app that you're building, what problem is it solving for the electric car or the solar panel owner? That's a really good question to ask because it might not be, as Debbie's saying, the dashboard isn't the solution. But um, one of the things that just rem reminded me, one of the pain points that came up in the research that I did for that petrol company was um, people with people overstaying their welcome in a charging space, 
right? Or people with petrol cars parking in an electric space and just parking there, right? Which really pisses people off. What I'm saying is, is there are nuances, there are pain points in this new electric world that don't exist in the petrol world, right? And so that, that's what I mean around electric pain points and needs as compared to, um, <clears throat> as opposed to maybe petrol ones. You see, it, there is a very much a delta in behavior between your lifestyle and how you fuel your car today and how you will tomorrow. But you can still look at tomorrow, even though nobody's got that mental model, by saying, if I was to do it, if, if it was like this, how would that work for you? Oh, I couldn't do that because I travel 200 miles a day or I need to go pick up my kids, so therefore I can't do that. Or there's something around that, the reasons around that. And you're like, okay, interesting. We can design that in or we can't, et cetera. All kinds of stuff. Better to understand the as is in, in reasonably good detail when it relates to these particular needs. Get the behavior down around car ownership and refueling and, and it will start to inform hypotheses for the, for the 2B state. Yeah. Just, I, and by the way, I also wrote a Medium article about this. So feel free to look up my Medium article. It was called like research for products that don't exist yet and don't start with a hypothesis. Throw a couple of those words plus Debbie Levitt and Medium into Google and I'm sure you'll stumble on my uh, article. Um, I probably read it here on YouTube also. So you can probably search YouTube for that. And I probably read the article and discussed it in one of our shows. I'll have to look for that. But for now, I'm going to put up the next question so Nick can start um, answering that. And I'll come back later with what episode has that article. Um, someone says, I'm a bit confused by the term concept testing. It seems to be used in different ways by different people. Could you explain the term a bit? I, honestly, it's kind of foreign to me. Um, in terms of concept testing, I know what I think it means. Um, and have I done it? Yeah, because I suppose you write that sort of stuff into a script for most times. So at least I'll usually have somebody, a product manager or somebody saying, hey, Nick, can you find, whilst you're doing that, could you find this out? You know, do people understand what we mean by, um, you know, an energy saving dashboard, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I'm going to pass on this one because it's not something that I know anything specifically about. Um, it's not something, you know, like I said, I've been asked to test concepts and to test understanding, semantics, all of that stuff, but specifically as as a thing. And this sounds like almost, it sounds like a boot camp thing maybe, but not something that's, that's hit my radar to date. Yeah, what I can add there, and by the way, I found the episode 155, if you want to hear me read the article and, and uh, see the discussion that came up around it. So I've heard concept testing used in a few different ways. Um, <clears throat> and I think I've even heard Larry Marine talk about it, uh, but not on the show, just something he and I were talking about. And I think it has to do with sometimes people who tend to work in like low fidelity, medium fidelity, high fidelity, uh, want to test the, the the concept when it's still in low fidelity, when it's really an early version of a possible solution, and they believe that there's some early testing that we can do here to see, are we starting to head in the right direction with this solution? Now, that's not my style of working, so I couldn't really tell you the best way to do that. We'd need to get that from Larry. I'm very much a medium fidelity person, though I'm very into evaluative and usability testing uh, all throughout my process to make sure I have the best concept, the best idea, the best solution, the best execution of an idea, because I don't want to just make a nice design or a design people can stumble through. I want to make sure I've solved the original problem. So while I believe in the idea of testing your concept early, um, I tend to be doing it in more of a medium fidelity universe. Um, Nick, does that trigger a thought for you? Yeah, I mean, the only, the only thought it triggers, uh, again, if this is concept testing, what are you waiting for? Why Why is concept testing a thing? You kind of said it yourself, Debbie. Like, what are you waiting for? Like, test early, test often, just do it. And don't call it a thing called concept testing. Like, if you've had an idea, test it in prototype, test it on the back of a napkin, test it any which way you can. But But the idea that you move forwards blindly, not knowing stuff and just hoping is ridiculous. I yeah, and I don't that. think they're going to do that. So Irena has commented, concept testing is a well-established market research method, basically testing whether your value proposition makes sense. It could be one page, it could be a prototype, it could be a landing page. 
So, uh, okay, maybe it's a market research thing, but again, that sounds a little cart before horse, like, hey, we have this idea, we made a prototype, or we did a design sprint, we made a prototype, now we're going to see if people want this. That's definitely a feature factory stuff that's not going to be user-centered or customer-centric. We're not working from, typically there, we're not working from real user needs. We're working from, we had this idea and we want to see if anybody wants it. Um, Irena says, I think concept testing is useful when you're working on something that doesn't have a market. Like, you already know people use dating apps. If you're making a new one, you don't need to concept test. Hmm, interesting, maybe. Um, and Shweta, I see your question. We'll put it on the list, but the list is really long and I'm not sure we can handle more questions. Nick, something else to add to concept testing? Nah, let's keep moving. If there's lots of questions, let's try to, I'll try to pick the pace up. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. We're both, uh, we both like to give thorough answers, shall we say. Uh, someone says, I have a question today. I'm proud of you. Uh, when <laughs> would you choose to do a heuristic analysis instead of usability testing or usability testing instead of a heuristic analysis. Who said you could only do one? Yeah, 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 exactly. Debbie smashed that. Like, f forget this like rule set thinking, you know? You do what you need to do to understand what's going on. That's the bottom line. Um, if we got a preference, I'm never taking heuristics over um, usability testing or user testing of any form, generally speaking, because heuristics, they have their place in our world, but they're very rarely used in my in my world there, there there is a specific application to use them but it doesn't come up that often in my in my working life um user testing is day in day out like bread and butter stuff um the times when heuristics are useful are when you need to <clears throat> arm or inform a clueless or uneducated audience to, to do a thing so i've used uh, heuristics quite successfully in the past to help n nursing staff or medical staff buying medical devices Right, because they're not HCI or UX experts, but they've got to buy things which are going to potentially kill people. They need to know how to evaluate them, and doing a rapid evaluation using a, a heuristic is is pretty pretty bloody great. Um, likewise, let's say you took Don Norman's uh, heuristics or Schneiderman's heuristic set. Um, you could turn somebody who has never seen UX into somebody who can very roughly give you an opinion on a website experience, right? Because you've given them a set of heuristics to guide themselves by. That's what I find them particularly useful for. For the very experienced user experience professional, you're probably not going to use them that often, to be fair. Yeah, and I totally agree. And just to not uh, burn too much time on anything, I, what I would add is a reminder that very often a heuristic analysis is one or more experts are going to look at this and tell you what they notice about what they think is good or bad usability. You can do that. You can certainly look at something and say what you notice, but that certainly does not undo the need for usability testing, and it does not supersede it. You definitely want to do the usability testing. If you can only choose one, you want usability testing. You could do both. Maybe usability testing finds some things, and you find other things as the expert heuristic analysis person. But um, be careful of only going with what you as the genius find. Yeah, and also bear in mind, I didn't know this until I scarily recently which is very wrong heuristics are meant to be a group it's not a n equals one sample you're meant to take a panel of people and they all complete the heuristic evaluation of the same experience and then you kind of aggregate these scores that's my understanding of it um it isn't about one person's opinion it isn't you know that it's just be careful with heuristics just be very careful with them and to be fair Get the heuristic set of Nielsen or Schneiderman into your head. Just get it in there. Because when I'm reviewing any website as an expert review, those heuristics are what's in, are, are basically what's guiding my, my, my lens. You know, no undo here, no contextual help here, blah, 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 right? They're fantastic. They're really great for that. So in, for that, for the individual, for the practitioner, if you want rules, there you go. Those are good rules. Yep, and Elena echoes what you're saying. Uh, heuristic evaluations should be conducted with a group of people, not just one individual. Ralitza says hello, and Elliot says good morning. Uh, super. So let me put up the next question, and uh, this one's going to have a nice short answer from one <laughs> or both of us. 
How many case studies should be in a portfolio if you have nine years of experience in UX UI design? I'm going to make my inappropriate joke again that my dad told me when I was 13. Uh, a speech should be like a mini skirt. It should be long enough to cover the subject, yet short enough to hold the attention. Um, which is basically a way of saying, exactly, it's a way of saying you have as many case studies in your portfolio that you need to do the job to sell yourself or for, to, to exemplify or evidence your experience. Um, if you're a junior and you've only got three, then three is the number, you know? But if you're a senior and you've got like 30, then pick the top 10, you know, or pick a, pick a sample you don't want all IA projects. You don't want all design projects. You don't want all research projects. You see what I mean? You want a nice mix of stuff that, that showcases what you can do. If I'm turning up to somebody's house as an architect and they want to see my portfolio to see what, what do the houses look like that I kind of design, they're going to make some decisions on my, me, my style as an architect or as an interior designer or as a stylist or what, whatever. Same thing as us as UXs, whether you're research or design or anything else. People need to see what kind of a person you are. It's not the quality, it's not how awesome you are, it's what quality you are, what kind of person you are. And that can only come through experience because UX is, experience, is, is inherently experiential. Yes, and hello to people just joining uh, in the audience. UX for the win, also known as Trina. Hung says, hi, Dr. Nick, evidently no love for me. Uh, UX for the win says hiring managers don't want to view 30 cases. Yep, that is Trina. so true. <laughs> Trina, Trina and I had a good interaction uh, on LinkedIn earlier this week where somebody was just unnecessarily harsh. She made a really great, really great point, really good post, Trina. And I just felt like I needed to jump in to kind of defend just because it was, he wasn't being horrible. He was just being just unnecessarily harsh. So, you know, stand tall, Trina. Good stuff. You know, I'm on your side. Yes, me too. Okay. Um, next question. Moving right along. Um, okay. This is a medium sized story and it says a question that challenges me. How does, how does a designer make a decision about positioning research alongside timelines? How much do you challenge if you're outnumbered? But do you just go along? I also want to add that some people are very agreeable and wish to be liked. It's challenging for those who don't have strong personalities to push back. Thoughts on how to handle this cultural and behavioral programming? I feel as UXers, we sometimes have to call the baby ugly. This is a great question. And honestly, it's right on point because I'm, I've had to become kind of slightly disagreeable, well, very disagreeable to be able to do the research that we do, right? I think what you're saying, your question is asking is how do I get research time in amongst the project planning? I think that's what, at the heart of this. Um, <clears throat> and you do have to be vocal. You do have to um, talk in terms of, you know, the risks. If you don't do this, you might build, you probably build the wrong thing or we're going to make assumptions and those assumptions are at great risk. Um, you unfortunately, because of the way that the UX world is, you have to be quite forceful or what's the word assertive in standing up for yourself. And that does mean you'll take, you'll get scars, you know, you'll get beaten up a little bit. It, it's not always plain sailing, but that's the nature of the UX world. And I think when Debbie and I and Darren and other people talk about UX is needing a thick skin, that's really what we're talking about here is you've got to put your kind of your thick crocodile skin on and go to the retro <laughs> or wherever, because you're going to be saying things, calling the baby ugly, doing all that kind of stuff, it, just to be able to insert yourself into the process of software or product engineering. Um, it shouldn't be this way. And when we've got appropriate UX leadership in place, it all goes away, but we've got quite a long road before we get there. So uh, keep doing what you do, stand up for yourself, don't take it personally if you get a couple of knocks, you know, that's normal. It's really normal. Um, we tend to be embattled user researchers. There will come a time in the future where it gets better, but for the moment, keep at it. It's good experience, believe it or not. It, it feels rough and it hurts, but it's building you stronger. Uh, this is good stuff. 
Yeah, and and to add to that, um, it, uh, yes, it's something we talk about on this channel a lot, that not everybody has the personality or comes from the, a culture where they're comfortable pushing back. Some people come from cultures or have personalities where they feel like um, it's more important to be polite. And look, I'm not going to tell you you have to change your personality or change your culture. You have to be whoever you are, and, and you don't have to be different for me or anybody else here. Um, it certainly, when you have a bold personality like me and Dr. Nick, um, when you want to speak up, you feel like you know how to do that. So I think, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to help give people who are shyer or prefer to be polite, hoping to be liked, you know, how do you, how do you blend that? And what I find the best way is, is number one, keep it unemotional. Number two, you don't want to point at anybody in particular. You don't want to say, well, your work is this, this, and this. So keep emotions out of it. Keep I feel out of it. Keep the word you out of it. Make sure it's always we, it's the team. And um, point at anything that maybe went wrong in the past. Hey, remember our last project when we ended up having to redo that thing, when we got information from customer support that there were people were having a lot of problems with this and then we had to figure out what those problems are and we had to redo it. I don't want that to happen in this project and I'm wondering if there's room for us to maybe um, do a little bit more research and be a little bit more evidence-based, be more knowledge-based, make some better decisions this time around because last time, you know, we yeah, you know, we didn't mean to, but we wasted some some time and probably some customer trust because we, you know, we didn't do as good a job as we could have. Um, I try to say things like that that again are not emotional. They're not feelings. They're not pointing at anybody in particular. It's the team. The team could have done better. Um, and sometimes you just have to kind of point at a disaster project and say, "Ooh, you know, what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again?" Nick. Let me, yeah, one last thing, and I'm kind of in the middle of a LinkedIn post on this. Personal style is something that, that is very much overlooked in today's world because we live in echo chambers. We live on social networks where there's this tendency towards a norm, right? There's like this gravity that pulls you into everybody else. Um, it's okay to not be the same as me and Debbie. It's okay to be you. Um, in fact, you should actively be you work to your strengths, your knowledge, your experience, your personality, your neuroses, your anxieties, whatever you are all about. Work, create a persona, a work persona that works for you. I've had to create my persona, which is a bit more of this bolder guy than I am in, in my personal life. I'm not this full on, but we've all had to become pretty full on just to be able to do our jobs. Um, that doesn't mean to say you have to stress yourself out trying to become a bold extrovert when you're not, when you're more quietly spoken, what have you. Some of the most powerful people that I've worked with are the exact opposite of me and Debbie, to be fair. They're really softly spoken. They choose their words. They, they, they've just got a manner about them and they are probably a lot more or as or more effective. But the point is, is it's not less effective. These are just different styles. OK, um, that's when we talk about chemistry and culture and in hiring managers. Often we're looking for that chemistry to see, you know, is your kind of style going to fit in with other people's styles? You'd have to be the same style as them, but they have to be able to work together. You see, so that's what this is really all about. So, like I said, just be yourself. It's something that I've, I, I tell my kids, I tell everybody, be you. Don't be what the rest of the world wants you to be or thinks you are. Be you. Speaking of being you, this may be a personal question, but are you wearing velour? No. What uh, do you mean? It's it? like a green and check top. Oh, oh, okay. It's like a flat, fleecy, flannelly. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. I... It's flannelly. Oh, my God. It's the, it was the lighting in there. I was like, it's so what shiny. Think? I think he's wearing velour. <laughs> Me, nah. I'm not at that point yet in my online persona. Maybe well, I'll start wearing some um, something lame, you know? Velour cardigan. It's in your future. Um, oh, hi, Darren Hood. I've heard of you. Um, okay. Uh, next question, I think, came from Irena. 
Context, I'm working on an internal platform for a company I work for, creating stuff for internal users. I intend to ask a lot of questions. Do you have any ideas on how to incentivize participation? I can't pay colleagues and can't really make them participate, but I'd like to make it worth their while besides creating a tool they'd enjoy. So you know, I'll tell you how I incentivize internals without money. Food. Uh, it's going to be hard. Yeah. So, so food, that's Donuts. a good, really good. When I'm in, that, I, I wasn't going to say that, but that's such a great one. But that's a call center strategy for me is sugar, sweet stuff. If you need to go to speak to call centers, people or, you know, nurses, teachers, people like that who are working on the job, you know, a box of biscuits to have with their tea or whatever just goes down a absolute storm and they'll sit there munching away whilst you're talking uh but generally speaking um i know you've got a lot of questions to ask so that for me is a, not a red flag but something that i would say go and review those questions see how efficient you're asking them and it's like packing if you're going to go uh traveling they say pack your rucksack and then take two thirds out and that's what you really need right just ask yourself that question of your research script, of the questions that you're going to ask. Do you really need to ask all those questions? And are they asked efficiently to get at a need or a pain or what have you? You can probably shave it down a bit. The reason why I say that is I'm a big fan of the 30 minute session, massive fan. And that's what I've been doing for the past year or so, because as I think you said last time, I hate watching all the, uh, the video back and it takes too long and I don't have time in sprint and all kinds of stuff. So you motivate or incentivize people by getting to say, look, we're going to fix the problem and blah, 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 but come talk to me. I need to talk to you for 20 to 30 minutes. It's not a depth interview. It's quick, quick fire, and then I'll let you get back to your stuff, et cetera. I find that, especially with internals, it's a much better way of creating a relationship and a network of people because you can go back to them and you're going to need to because you're not going to have limitless internal people and you can't keep generating new samples. You're going to have to start recycling. And so that means not pissing them off, not doing a 45 minute depth interview so that they say, I'm never seeing you again. That's the bottom line here. It's about, you know, think about it. If somebody's coming after you and you don't really care about their project, you're not going to dedicate an hour or you're not going to be checked in for that full hour either. So just think about that. See if you see if you can um, see if you can get people with low effort. Oh, she said, to be clear, I didn't mean a lot of questions in one session, probably over the course of the project. Thanks for the advice. Short and sweet. Yeah, and food. Hey, everybody, join me in the break room for a 30 or 40 minute chat, and I've got a little buffet set up. Yeah. Some pizza, yeah. some Mexican food, little cake. Coffees. Coffees. Co good coffee that goes down a storm, or you sit down in the cafeteria if you're in a fancy building uh, with a little, you know, aid board sign on your thing free coffees, spend 20 minutes with me, you know, test my prototype, all of that kind of guerrilla style, all in play. Yep, Ralitza says, from my PM days, I would invite people and say, lunch is on me, keep it informal. Melanie Levy says, in call centers, I've used many boxes of pizza to draw people in to do in-person testing on their lunch break. So yes, food. Um, okay, next is um, a two-part question. So we will handle it in pieces. First it says, two questions. What do people mean that I should, quote, add personality to my portfolio? Yeah, I like that. I think what they mean is add, it's demonstrating your personal style that we just spoke about, okay? I think it's about exemplifying that. You know, this is my approach, this is my style, this is how I do things. What it isn't is another bloody templated portfolio where it's just cold. I don't get to learn about Nick or Debbie. I'm just seeing the stuff that you've done. Well, yeah, but you're the person doing it. And so it's your approach, your process, your perspective. What decisions did you make that, that somebody else might not have made or that, that, that you know is a personal decision? These things I want to see in a portfolio. I want to see the character. I want to see the, your personality, but not, you know, I've got pink hair and I like dancing or whatever that kind of personality stuff is. I mean, the stuff that talks about you as a professional, your professional persona, should we say? Style. <sighs> Style. So my answer to this, even though I don't disagree, my answer to this is a little bit different. And that is, you should have asked whoever said that to you what they meant. 
because someone said this to you. Someone said, hey, your portfolio needs more of your personality or some personality. Ask them what they mean. If someone gives you advice and you don't understand that advice or the advice is not, everyone say it with me, meaningful, actionable, and helpful, and you don't know what to do next, ask them. You Sure, you can come on our show and you could say, hey, what did someone else mean when they said this weird thing to me? We're guessing. We don't know. So if someone gives you advice that isn't clear to you, please don't forget to ask them what they mean or ask them for an example. That way Nick and I aren't guessing what this means and, and you can get it right from whatever source gave that to you. Um, Trina says, in Enterprise UX, I find employees are simply happy someone cares to ask about their experiences. Oh, you're a few minutes behind, but yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, so add more personality to your portfolio. I honestly don't know what that means until that person tells me or shows me an example. Many portfolios are just telling the story of a project. I don't expect them to be wacky or weird or or jokey or whatever so I'm not sure what that means I've never looked at a portfolio project and said your work looks great but there's not enough personality here I don't think I want to meet you yeah could you please put some more like some uh put some Minecraft references or Game of Thrones in there or some smileys I don't yeah. know right here, here's one of my YouTube karaoke videos <laughs> yeah exactly so, so I don't know what this means, and I'm not convinced this is a problem. We'd have to see your portfolio. I would rather you tell a, 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 an interesting, compelling story about the work you are able to do. I'm not too sure what more personality means. The second part of this question is, um, oh, Faye says, what if my professional persona is panicking until you have more clarity? <laughs> Yes, in that case, uh, send that person a message later when you've done some breathing. Um, okay, the second half of the question says, and what is more important, the number of projects you have or how high in quality they are? I think we answered this one already. We already said, now of course someone sent this in, uh, you know, half hour ago, but yes, we said definitely quality over quantity. I think there's nothing more to add there. Nick, quality, quantity, the size matter. What do you want to say? I'm so in that size matter mindset right now. I'm thinking, how much of that should I actually say out loud? Um, I think quantity doesn't matter, but it does to an, everything matters, quality and quantity. We talk, this is black and white again. I agree. Debbie's absolutely spot on. If you have a, 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 a massive folio full of rubbish, obviously that's no good. And if you've only got one really great project, that's no good either. You really need that balance. You know, you need, um, it, it would be nice to have a balance of projects of small ones, big ones, all, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I uh, can't remember what I was saying, but there we go. go on. I agree with that. Um, okay, here is uh, an interesting question we've never gotten before, and I look forward to Nick's answer. What is the difference between discovery and discoverability? Oh, crikey. <laughs> Everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's the difference between a brick and a piranha? Uh, well, just they're not the same thing. <laughs> um, okay, I can see why. I'm not taking the, I'm not taking the mickey out of the, of the question asker. Sorry. Um, discoverability, we'll just smash that one out of the way quickly, is, you know, findability. Or do, do, can you find the thing? Like, can you find the red shoes? Can you discover that um, that your pay grade is on the internet? You know, there's finding stuff. Uh, whereas discovery is generally a much more uh, defined phase of a project, which involves uh, use, predominantly user research about understanding the context, the user's needs, and the and the pains of the thing we're about to build. About to build, generally speaking. Sometimes whilst we're building it, if you're a dual or a tri track, but that's a specialist case. Um, discovery is a really, really important feature of UX in general or dis uh, of digital because generally speaking, we don't just build stuff. You're gonna, you want to learn some stuff about the users. Is it solving a problem? Is it meeting needs? You know, what's it there to do? Are we going to build the right thing the right way? Um, and that's what discovery is generally there to do. 
Uh, Discovery's partner is evaluative, which is the user testing side, which is checking, are we building the right thing? But generally speaking, those two, generative and evaluative, i.e. discovery and user testing, which are covered thoroughly in Debbie's Delta CX book, um, are, yes, they are. <laughs> um, are, those are mainstays, those, that, that's cornerstone stuff of user research and discoverability is more around um, information architecture, navigation, interaction design. Totally agree. Yes, I, I have almost nothing to add to that. So um, yes, and uh, and if you're looking for a book of mine to read, I would suggest the new one, Customers Know You Suck. Um, Delta CX is a good enough book, but holy cats, I'm much more excited about my new one. Um, and there's some good stuff in there about discovery. There isn't anything in there about discoverability, and I'm not even sure the previous book has anything about discoverability, but uh, Customers Know You Suck is already helping people do their jobs. So holy cats everybody give it a chance um okay uh no nick you you're breathing right. yes yeah just before i forget because darren is on the call and i wanted to say this earlier um darren's uh chit chat was so awesome last time that everybody in this call should be at darren's ux chit chat which is coming up in a couple of weeks later in february check it out <clears throat> um well i just thought it was a really cool unique ux kind of event and it was online anyone from anywhere in the world can join and it's just a really great way to meet other uxs and just have an informal chat about life uh, and i think it's really cool so well done darren i'm a big huge fan i'll be there on i'll be there so was debbie was at the last one too um uh, cool. yes but the problem is he's moved them from thursday to friday and friday i'm usually doing a show so i am not sure i'm going to be able to attend them anymore um we do one also in the Delta CX community. The first Thursday of every month is our, um, we co I just call it our live video networking. Um, and you can find, if you go to deltacx.com slash links, you'll see it in our Google Calendar. And you'll, if you're in our Slack or our Discord, you'll see it in live events. So um, it's completely free and we hope you'll join and say hi. You can talk about UX or you can talk about not UX. Uh, the people who came to the last one um, actually got to watch some of the video from my wedding. <laughs> Uh, some of the karaoke video where I did some uh, operatic metal. Okay, next question. What do you think of UX designers transitioning to or wanting to become product managers so that they have more say in the product being built? I've spoken to many designers thinking of this. So I, I actually, when product became a thing in 2017, 2018, um, I, I think I still strongly believe this. I think every product manager should have been a UXer first. I think it's a prerequisite to being a product manager. And I know that's pretty controversial, but I can't think of a good reason why that doesn't still hold true in my head. Um, some of the best product managers that I've worked with have been UXers previously. They're just ultimately user-centric people. And once you've got that user-centricity in a product, man product manager's head, that informs so much of their thinking for the team that they're effectively managing or working with. Um, I think that's, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a really good thing, I, I think. Um, otherwise, what you tend to see, and apologies to product managers, you get product managers who, they're generalists, right? They don't have any of that background information to inform their thinking. Uh, often they learn from the teams that they're working with. Um, whereas if you can shortcut all that by having a UX who turned PM, I think that's a great thing personally. Just my opinion there. Yeah, and what I would add to that is um, if it's more of a product, like a traditional Scrum Agile product owner job where you are mostly corralling engineers and grooming the backlog, you probably don't want that. Uh, you know, they, someone else can take that kind of engineering conductor orchestrator person. If this is one of those product manager jobs that says you're doing the UX, you're going to do research, you're going to do design or, or some of these, or you're going to shepherd these, or you're going to control these, then I say, yep go right ahead go I, I predicted last year that a an increasing number of ux professionals will spend the four thousand dollars to go get a product manager certificate and will start applying for product manager jobs and a lot of these product manager certificates look 
kind of bullshitty. You know, a lot of them just say, uh, you're going to learn how to coordinate stuff, but mostly you're going to learn how to talk to customers and make wireframes and write some code because evidently a product manager doesn't know what their job is anymore and they're just doing everybody's job, which has to piss everybody off. Who is happy? Which developers are happy with the product manager writing a little code because they spent a few days studying it in a certificate course? Um, uh, Carla, I see you've got a question. I'm going to add that to the list. And um, Ralitsa says, hot take. To be honest, the amount of politics involved in order to be a great product manager is too much. This may or may not be something you like and are okay with. You've got to be great at it. Totally agree. Uh, product manager can be a thankless, ugly job. So you want to make sure that it is something you want to do. But I think hypothetically, it could be something that a very strategic, very experienced UX professional might be able to do. And that's why I'm encouraging everybody in their UX jobs to be more strategic, to talk more about product strategy, to talk more about UX strategy, to talk about the overarching customer experience, end-to-end -end journey, all the touch points, strategy. Talk about these things. They're not somebody else's job. Make sure you're involved in that. And if you can do it from your job with your title, please do. And if you want to try moving into a PM role, give it a try and let us know how it goes. Strategy is something that's been underplayed in UX for a very long time. There's a guy called Paul Bryan, B-R-Y-A-N. Oh, I don't like a, him. I know. I, I don't have much interaction with him, but he has been doing for about a decade a UX strat conference. Um, strategy in agencies or strategists has been a big deal for a long time. I, I've always found it kind of odd that strategy, why we haven't got UX strategists. Um, maybe that's what the product manager is today, or maybe we as UX professionals, we're strategists anyway. But it's, I support Debbie's point 100%. A lot of what I do is very strategic. Um, a lot of what comes with seniority is strategic thinking. And you start to, I've spent a lot of time with my product managers having long chats and giving them ideas and inspiring them and help in helping informing them. Uh, that's how you can really ingratiate yourself with a product manager is by bringing the strategy stuff to them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not a Paul Bryan fan, so if you want to check out that conference, uh, go ahead. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm not yeah. recommending it, but I just know of it. I don't know it. Yeah, um, uh, I don't have a, a positive impression of him, but again, if you see his conference and you're interested in it, you know, give it a go. Um, my book is designed to teach people how to be more strategic about the customer experience. It's written for everybody. It's written for product and marketing and sales and strategists because I want everyone to be customer centric, but not everyone does UX and CX work. So if you want to think more about being strategic and being able to give that advice and talk about those things, I still recommend my own freaking book because that's why I wrote it. Um, uh, Solomon says, I find there's a lot of people that focus too heavily and hyperfixate on craftsmanship. Trina, UX for the Wind says, Debbie, ooh, I don't like him. Never guessing what you're thinking. I saw Paul Bryan do a couple of white savior things that I was not happy with. Let me just reference the, the <laughs> craftsmanship point in, in chat. Um, I hear what you're saying. It does get referred to an awful lot. Um, and it's much more referred to in the design side of things than the research side of things. But there is a craft of UX. There is no question of doubt. I mean, at least in my mind, it doesn't matter what your perspective is, whether you're an art director or a scientist or anything in between or all that stuff. I think um, everybody can agree that there is a definite large element of craft to UX, especially in the design of, of or just crafting experience, which requires research and design. It's an iterative process and, and user centricity is, is science and craft or art and science or whatever you want to call that. It just is. Um, we actually have two questions left so uh, and more time to go. So if people want to ask a few more questions, I think we'll have time for it. You can ask them live in the chat. You can send it through the anonymous link on deltacx.com slash links. And please remember to please subscribe. I am still shadow banned on YouTube and I need all of the subscription and likes and comments on YouTube that you can possibly stand to give uh, the videos. Please, please 
Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so here is our next question. And it says, hello, Debbie and Dr. Nick. My one weakness is storytelling. Any good books or courses to take on storytelling, written and spoken? Thank you both. Hmm. Interesting. No, I don't. I, I mean, when I was at the agencies <clears throat> five, six years ago, it was a, when storytelling became the thing in 2015. Um, Everybody was running storytell workshops and creative directors were teaching everybody how to storytell because they're all amazing at it or would be getting better at it themselves. I don't consider myself a master storyteller by any stretch. Um, it's a great skill to have. I think it gets a little bit overplayed or quite a lot overplayed, if I'm honest. But storytelling as a skill for a UXer is undeniably essential. If it's just writing your portfolio or CV, there's storytelling going on. Um, so it's going to impact everything you do. So it's a great thing to have. I think there's a bazillion courses. You should be able to find one quite easily. I would recommend you get a recommended one because there's so many out there. It's probably a real, a real wild west. But yeah, good, it's a good thing to have. Yeah, I agree too. I've, I've definitely had a lot of conversations recently with people who, who wanted to or needed to improve some of their storytelling in their resume and or their portfolio. Um, I don't know of a good book or course on this. I do know we've done one or two shows on this. If you go to YouTube and you search for Delta CX Try just typing Lee, L-E-E. -E. She was our guest on a couple of shows, and I think her topic once or twice was around storytelling and interviewing and how to, one of them was storytelling, had storytelling in the title. One of them, I think, had interviewing in the title, but we talked about telling your story in a more compelling way during interviews. That might have been episode 128 from memory. But um, yeah, you know, you can always go to YouTube and you can write Delta CX and a couple of keywords and see what comes up. I've got like 700 videos on YouTube. There's usually at least one or two about whatever topic is on people's minds. Um, so give that a try. Oh, Nick, I hope you're okay. I hope you don't have the covid cough that i am stuck with i don't interact with the outside world to get catch anything okay that's got positives and negatives um <laughs> it's called working from home the, the hermit the hermit stance um Okay, so, uh, oh, Solomon says, I've been told I speak too high level when discussing my projects. A lot of my projects are extremely te technical and complex. It's like trying to explain why ice is slippery to non-physicists. Okay, but if people are complaining that you're being too high level, you got to give them more. Yeah. Nick, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. This, I, honestly, being able to, storytelling is a great store, is a great skill, but I would, actually say the better skill is simplification like abstraction if you can take complicated things and make them simple and communicate them to people who don't know you are going to win it's, it's, it's something that i do all day every day i don't i think most of us do it but we're not even aware that we do it it's a skill that you're going to cultivate through show and tells and demos and answering questions at the end where where yeah you're 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 reducing you see what i mean it's a real skill to know that the juice you know the essence the core dna of a kind of an explanation if you really know your stuff it's actually quite easy to get down to that reduced bit uh, and that's actually a good acid test for whether somebody know if some if you know whether somebody if you fight to find out whether somebody knows what they're talking about right um ask them to explain it to you that's why teaching, by the way, is the best way of learning. You can't teach something that you don't know very, very well. So, yeah, speaking at the right level, abstracting things down and knowing what is the killer point to make is super important. Because we're dealing with people's attention, remember? You've got a window. You need to get into that window with the killer, with the, with, with, you know what I mean? You've got, to, you've got to make the impact. And if you go too wide or too high or too low, you'll just miss the target. There's a sense and you, you will get it. Just keep keep working. It'll come to you. Eventually, you'll make wicked decks that just smash that target. And the only thing I would disagree with there is um, I don't believe that teaching is the best way of learning. I think learning is the best way of learning. I want my teachers to already have learned. Oh, no. What I mean to say is, is 
teaching is the best way of learning abstraction, uh, of simplification. Like you have to know your stuff in order to be able to simplify. Ah, oh, thank you. Sorry, I messed that up. Yeah, yeah, I, I probably got it wrong. But that this is it's that basic principle that newbies boil the ocean. They they do all this stuff because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know when you know what you're doing, you can do it <laughs> quickly and, and effectively. And that's the same verbally when you're explaining something. Instead of explaining everything, you just go, yeah, UX is this, right? There you go. That, that, I, yeah, enough. Beautiful. Thank you. Sorry, I disagreed with the wrong thing. Bay no, says no, no. episode 16. Oh, I think that was the one where Lee Fake interviewed me and I did a terrible job, but that's just from memory. Uh, thank you, Faye. Um, okay, next question. What are your points of view on companies that build their quarterly product or feature roadmaps, OKRs, or strategies upon NPS scores and efforts to improve those? Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. I know. We've all been in that meeting room, right? Writing on the walls, right? In an away day in a hotel somewhere, wanting to <clears throat> die drinking terrible coffee. Um, NPS, we can talk about that all night. We can talk about SUS, all of these awful freaking scores, right? They're, they're, they're bullshit metrics, in my humble opinion, okay? They're executive metrics that people like to hear. Do they actually have any real validity in what they're trying to say? Or do people uh, misinterpret them? Hell yeah. Um, what am I? What was the question? I can't actually read the screen because of the resolution. Oh, basically, sorry. This was um, chaos on base com OKRs. Companies building product and feature roadmaps and OKRs and strategies based on efforts to improve NPS. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it all comes back down to NPS. I think that's why I'm answering it that way. I think because um, the quarterly roadmap thing, I, I don't really have much opinion on. I mean, I think that's more of a product person's view. Uh, but doing it on NPS scores is not not good. I mean, that's not a good metric for judging what your audience needs and wants. You know, whether they liked it or not, or were a detractor or or positive, whether they would recommend it to a friend, doesn't tell me anything about their needs, their context, their pains. It's it doesn't seem anywhere near appropriate. In fact, it seems like the most inappropriate way of doing it possible. Like you might as well just build something in a shed. You've probably got a better chance of doing it. <laughs> um, something like that, right, Deb? So, yeah, so there's a bit about this in my book um, because someone shared with me a screenshot from an online community they were in where someone said, you know, our NPS scores are not very good and we want to improve them. Um, we also know the reasons and the root causes of why people are giving us poor NPS scores, but our company has decided they're not going to work on any of those things. So can anybody here in the forum tell me how we can improve our NPS score? And I was just like, this, this is like one of the, yeah, this is one of the <laughs> worst questions ever because you're saying, look, we're, we're, we've got poor customer satisfaction. We know this. We know why, or we think we know why, but we've pre-decided that we don't want to fix the reasons why we're getting poor scores. So can someone give us a tip on how to raise the score? At that point, your company obviously only cares about raising the score. They care about, can we trick somebody into something to get a better number, but they don't actually care about the customer experience. They don't care about the user experience, and they clearly don't care about the long-term arc of attracting customers, making them happy, and hoping they're going to stay and and hoping they're going to tell people good things about your company you don't care you're stuck in that middle piece of customer satisfaction but you don't seem to genuinely care if customers are satisfied or not you're just hoping they'll give you a higher score this also reminds me of a story of a really terrible car dealer i used to have to go to where i lived to get my car fixed because they were the closest car dealer to fix that car and my car was having a weird sound and I brought it in and they had it for like a day and then they gave it back to me. They're like, we can't figure it out. 
you know, come back another day. And I'm like, why would I come back another day? You just had it and you couldn't figure it out. Well, I don't know, come back another day. Maybe someone else will look at it. I'm like, why didn't someone else look at it now? And they're like, ah, we'll give you another appointment. Come back another day. Well, I came back another day. They still couldn't figure it out. And then the guy leans over the counter at me and he goes, and when they survey you, make sure you give us a five out of five. <laughs> And I said, yeah. I am absolutely fucking lutely not giving you a five out of five. <laughs> you are absolutely getting a one out of five. I have had to walk away from my work twice in the last week or two so you can look at my car and you don't even know how to fix it. And this is BMW? No. No, I'm not giving you a five. So yeah, that's where we realize someone just cares about the score, but they don't actually care about the customer or user experience. So what's typically going to happen with these is often a manipulation. How, what is some small thing that we can change? Or can we push people to click this button more so we can pretend we achieved a goal? But NPS can be a little hard to fake because you're asking people, even though it's a crappy question and it's a crappy metric, you're asking them, would they recommend you to another person? And an unhappy person's going to give you a poor score there. So even though I don't love NPS, okay, you can use it to take some temperature. Um, but, uh, oh, Noisy Doll says, uh, aren't they vanity metrics? They can be. What can UXRs do to turn this tide? It sounds like students asking how to get extra credit after not doing the homework. Is NPS even valid? Yeah, so a lot of these questions are great questions. And, and I think that NPS can absolutely be garbage. But again, as I said earlier, if a company loves NPS and they're into it, to me, I want to use that to spin up generative and qualitative research. Hey, our NPS is negative 9,000. Do we know why? Do we know what the root causes are? Do we know why people are unhappy with us? Are we seeing people leaving and downgrading? You know, let's really fix these. So if this, to go back to the original question, if the product team is, is road mapping and prioritizing things by things they think are gonna fix the NPS, my question would be, where did you get that information? Because if we have a poor NPS score, do we know what's going wrong? Did we validate that that is the real problem and the root cause? How do we know what the, the solution is? And so to me, this leaves me wondering a lot of things. Sure, it's great when NPS or customer complaints can inspire a product team to make some improvements, but how do you know you correctly understand the problem and how are you sure about the root causes and how did you determine what the solution is? I'm still worried about that. Nick, something to add? Yeah, I just, I'm just a question really. I, I, I'm not an expert on this at all, but NPS obviously comes from the world of kind of market research or somewhere in that realm. Sure do. Right, so in which case, it's much more of a brand health metric or some kind of indicator, right? A, a brand level. Right. Would right. You so, this yeah, it's to a yeah, it's usually would you recommend our company or this product to a friend or colleague and you're given a zero to ten or one to ten uh, or how likely are you to recommend us to a friend or colleague and you have to give them a, a zero to ten or one to ten score um, scores that are six or lower are called detractors. Scores yeah, that yeah. are seven or eight are called passives. Scores that are nine or 10 are called promoters because they think that they're gonna be loyal because they, they claim they're gonna recommend you. And then the score is calculated in a really foolish, bizarre way. Okay, so now let's go back to this question, right? If the question is, um, would you recommend this product or service or thing to, to uh, a friend? And we're now going to use that to inform our quarterly roadmap. Do you see what I'm saying? Once you link those right, two how? together, it's ridiculous. It right. sounds absurd. 
Right, that's why I'm asking, how do you know what the problems are? How did you validate what the root causes of anybody's problems are? How, how did you come up with the solutions? Very often, another problem of NPS or kind of its ripple effect is people go, oh yeah, we got a bunch of really low scores and, and uh, people wrote all kinds of complaints in the survey box. And so we're just going to read some of these complaints from the survey box and, oh, it looks like people are saying our dashboard sucks. Let's get what we could do to our dashboard. You know, this is guesses and assumptions. Even if your dashboard does suck, and even if you're getting complaints or survey responses about it, that doesn't mean you know what's going wrong with it. It doesn't mean you know why people are unhappy. It doesn't mean you know what the root causes are. So typically I see people getting having a survey or an NPS survey and they get the results and they just start guessing what the problem is and guessing how to fix it and and that can still lead to customer unhappiness okay on a bit of a tangent but totally relevant um and I've done this recently uh, not in, I've done this for many years when I'm working on a national brand like either an ISP or like a utility company you know it'll vary in your co countries but those types of company don't generally get very well reviewed just because of the nature of the work that they do. It's customer service, it's heavy and lots of unhappy people. Trustpilot is what I'm driving at, right? Have a look at Trust, Trustpilot in terms of, you would talk about promoter score and or just understanding sort of the voice of the user. Trustpilot, look at, a, 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 at an ISP or a, you know, they always get like a one score, like a gas company or an electricity company or a telephone company. Um, and then have a look at the comments and read through them. You will learn everything you need to know. <laughs> Not, you'll have a tremendous amount of insight. Um, something like that, if you're talking about a quarterly roadmap, if I would, if I get my trust pilot score off the floor to a three, would be remarkable and worth billions. That would be the target and make your roadmap do that. Yes, but just because we read some people's reviews sometimes doesn't mean we've understood the problem correctly oh, no, or framed yeah, yeah. the problem correctly. So you're right. These are, as Trina said in the chat, this is preliminary research. So sure, this is good voice of the customer research to, to hear what people are saying and get some of their comments and reactions, whether it's Trustpilot or NPS or survey or tweets. These are good sources of information, but they usually don't tell us what's going wrong, who, what, where, why, when, how, and they don't necessarily tell us how to fix it. What typically happens is people guess what the source of the problem is and they guess how we should fix it and that's what goes on the roadmap. So while I appreciate that you're looking to make improvements to the product so that you can make customers happier, I wonder if, ever, if this is a guessing sandwich where we're guessing at the problem, we're guessing at its root causes, and we're guessing at how to solve it. So also, one last thing, one very yeah. quick thing. If NPS is the North Star or the key metric, probably marketing are driving, probably, because that's their currency. That's the language. That, that's what they do. Um, well, I don't have any comment, pass more commentary on that. Otherwise, it's probably an education piece that you need to do in, in, in this case, right? Mm -hmm. If you can get them to understand. Or, again, with the Nick Fine go rogue style, go ahead and get the evidence right? Show them users having pains, make it really short, low effort, all of that good stuff. Do it anyway. Don't ask for permission. I mean, get consent, do it ethically, all of that stuff. And then challenge their NPS stuff with actual evidence rather than that stuff shit. I, I, I know better Then you've got actually something to show. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, Ralitsa says, also, this is not really a direct product or service assessment. Recommending a product does not mean the product or service is good. It only means it's pretty good for my use case, talking about NPS. Yeah, I mean, again, we could do 12 hours of shows on NPS because it's a very misleading metric because the survey question is usually, how likely are you to recommend this to a colleague or friend or whatever it says. And then what happens is you're usually your marketing people or market research people says, well, these people are loyal. The people who gave us high scores are loyal. And I say, well, hold on. We, this isn't a measure of loyalty. This is a measure of, do I predict in the future that I might give you some good word of mouth? That doesn't mean I'm loyal. It just means I might tell somebody something nice about you, or if they score low, I'm not going to tell somebody nice something nice about you, or I'm going to tell them something bad about you. So the, one of the first problems with NPS is even if there is some usable voice of the customer data in there, it, it's already blurred by people saying, well, this is a measurement of our customer loyalty, 
No, a measurement of your customer loyalty is how many people did you keep this month? How many people left? How many people downgraded? How many people upgraded? How many people stayed the same? Customer loyalty is how many people did you retain and how many of them grew with you and how many of them wanted you less. The NPS is not a measurement of customer loyalty and I love to tell people the story of the company that I recommended to everybody and used heavily for 10 years and loved, loved, loved until I stumbled on their competitor. And I canceled my account with the company I'd been with 10 years and I paid the company that I've, I've now been with. It didn't matter that I gave them a nine. It didn't matter that for 10 years, every time they NPS to me, I gave them a nine. And they said, Debbie is loyal. Debbie was loyal until she was not. Customers are loyal until they are not. They find a better product. They find a cheaper product. They're sick of you. Whatever it is, your salespeople stink. Your support people are annoying. Whatever it is. Loyalty is fleeting. It's not 1930. Loyalty is fleeting. And NPS can't measure how close you are to losing someone who's even giving you an 8, 9, or 10. So all of this is a mess. Um, there you go. Um, I will, we've got a new question from Holly. And I will put up um, a, some previous questions. We got Holly, you're on the list. There's a couple of people before you. Nick and I usually go a little bit long on these, so we're here like another 20, 30 minutes if Nick can stand it. Yeah, all good. Okay, thanks. I think this is Shweta's question from Memories, and she said, why do a lot of design leaders on LinkedIn advocate so much for craft over strategy? I've never understood. I've seen a lot of them debate Figma and tools over problems. I'm gonna go with incompetence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm somewhere. I'm just trying to be nice. It, I mean, I, what design folk, and I'm not being horrible to design folk, I'm just describing them. Design folk are tool people. They are inherently tool based, and their thinking is tool based. Um, that's not actually, that's being really very unfair. I'm going to take that back. I take that completely back because there are some absolutely amazing, dynamic, incredible thinkers that I've met in the design world. Um, it's just different, different either either incompetence or different styles from different different practices. Um, you've got to be aware right now. There's a lot of ignorance going on. Um, whether that's willful ignorance or just ignorance, ignorance, I don't know. Right? Um, what are you pointing at? Uh, Trina wrote, "Even a designer shouldn't be tool based." Yeah. No. That, they're very tool based. Younger generations are very tool based because people think that skills come in the tool. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like the old Photoshop. I'm now a designer type stuff, um, which is why you see all these like dovetail, like helps you do research, really, since when. Anyway, no, that's a whole nother fight. Um, where am I? Creative directors and, and so those design types uh, not being strategic enough and being too, too tool based. Yeah, it, it just it it happens. Um, there's a real fight against process. There's a real fight against things that they're either unaware of or unfamiliar with. I think that's fair enough, right? Because if they knew the power of kind of iterative user centricity, no one argues against it, right? No one says user centricity. But I've been in more fights in the past month with design leaders telling me that process doesn't matter that user cent of telling me uh, fighting against user centricity and i it's mind blowing to me i mean i it's so it's like we're in a parallel universe what the f man i mean there's no way we should be having these discussions with very very senior design leaders it's really deeply alarming it's like you it's like people are saying user centricity is no good it doesn't work and we'd much rather go back to designer centricity which is exactly what Alan Cooper was writing about in uh, Inmates Wrote the Asylum. You know, d developers writing their own, uh, designing their own in in experiences, basically, being the wrong person for the job. And we've come full circle, like in 30 years or 20 years. It's insane. And it's all because of the lack of knowledge transfer. Also, what you can't do is take somebody who's a very senior design leader and then reset them to zero in one of their skills, which is called UX, because they don't like that. <laughs> they don't like that. And that's what you're seeing a lot of. 
Yeah, and I think that um, the tool conversation is the easier one to have. Uh, it's much easier to say, oh, Debbie's an idiot, she likes Aksher, or Figma's the way to go, you're all wrong, or whatever. And Nick and I and others, Trina, other people have been around long enough to know that every few years a tool comes along and steals everybody's breath. And then a few years later, it falls into, uh, you know, it's looked at as ridiculous and outdated and what, you're using OmniGraffle? You know, what year are you from? And, you know, and, and so we all have this tool snobbery that, that doesn't really make sense. You, you know, when I started in, in all of this stuff, I was just using Photoshop because I'd already paid for it. And so I was making wireframes and layouts in Photoshop. I didn't know any different or better. And then I worked at a job. I worked at Sony and they demanded that I make wireframes in InDesign. I kid you not. And they required InDesign stuff. And then I said, and then well, before that, I was teaching myself Axure. So I said, I, I've decided Axure is the best tool. I want to learn that one and I want to become an expert at it. And then the next job I worked at, they were, that was Wells Fargo. Everybody was in OmniGraffle, which I thought was awful to use and, and so clunky. And luckily, I was the official Axure prototype keeper, I didn't even have to deal with the OmniGraffle. There's always another tool that we could be using or looking at, and it doesn't matter. You could be the best person on the planet at, at Figma, and you could be a terrible information architect and interaction designer. The tool is not the skill, because you could use the tool and still be bad at the skill you're supposed to be doing. So the tool conversation is usually a bit of a smoke screen, because the tool is not the skill. Anybody can learn Figma in hours. That doesn't make you great at UX. So it, it's a misguided smoke screen. Yeah. Remember, these. this is all coming from a visual modality, if you know what I mean, like a visual mindset, uh, whereas UX is not about that. And you guys know that, but these people don't know that. They know, UX is this beautiful thing about making everything easier and better and all of that, right? It's not, it's not about design. And when you make it about design, it then becomes about the tools because that's what design is about. Um, I laughed when you said, Debbie, you said, uh, we've seen all these tools come and come and go. Um, Sketch, InDesign, uh, InVision, Marvel, was that one of them? Yeah, OmniGraffle, iRise. Yeah, exactly. Or there's a, there's these a, were things a that at one point I was told, you might not get the job if you can't use this. Yeah, which is, it, again, it's ridiculous. I've, I've worked with some incredible designers who, like you, still today, make beautiful, incredible rock wireframes ultra quickly in Photoshop because that's the tool and it's a tool and it does the job. Great. No, I'm not judging. <laughs> the point is, is um, it isn't tool based and Debbie nailed it. Absolutely smashed it. There mm -hmm. are some tools like Axure, which I think are critical cornerstone tools that we use um, in UX or in, in a user centric design process. Um, if there were, if Figma, were to develop Axure-like power in interaction design, we'd move to that. It's about the best tool for the job. And, and ultimately, the process, or the user-centric iterative process, the tools are there to support the practitioner supporting that process. Right? We're not servants to our tools. The tools obey us. And again, the tool is not the skill because anybody can use Figma, but that doesn't make them a great information architect, interaction designer, problem finder, problem solver. Um, Noisy Doll says, do you think the heavy emphasis on tools and visual deliverables is a product of social media and how that favors beautiful pictures and shallow discourses? You know what? Visual designers have always had a one up on anyone because they make beautiful things and we buy with our eyes and aesthetics and all of that great stuff. So whether you're applying for a job and you're competing against one of these people, if, if you've got really high end visual design skills, you've got a major one up on everybody else. And the stuff that I think it was Tommy or 
some of these people on LinkedIn are saying, you know, uh, Juan, Juan Ramirez said, uh, everybody must have visual design skills. And I really push back against it. I but think he's I not blocked wrong. him. Yeah, he's not wrong in that if you can make your stuff look good or it designed well, form and function, you're going to have a competitive advantage against everybody else. Bottom line, you're going to have a better CV or resume. You're going to have a better looking portfolio. Um, does it make you a better UXer? No, in that regard, not at all. Uh, but visual design skills are really great to have, for sure. Every Listen, as a user researcher, I'm making decks. I'm putting show reels together. I'm spending as much time in Creative Cloud as I did when I was a designer, right? Because I'm designing my outputs because my outputs are really important. They're most, more important than my activity, kind of, should we say, because I'm socializing what I've done. And if no one understands the needs of our users, we're screwed. We're not going to build the right thing. We're not going to make money. Um, we've got a few more questions, and then we're going to be out of time. So I've got one, two, three, four questions. Hopefully, we can get through those in the 20 minutes. Thanks for staying late, Nick. Um, OK, Ralitsa says, I find crafting and, in, and great reports and presentations is absolutely essential to being a successful researcher. Wow, you, Nick was just saying this. How how do you make reports and presentations or any communication you issue to stakeholders as a researcher better? Any resource recommendations, courses, articles? Excuse me. Yeah, I can make this one easy for you. Okay, forget all the courses and all that BS, okay? Forget it all. I, I'm giving you permission to be simple. Um, I told, we talked about simplicity earlier. This is that simplification skill needed. To be able to abstract down to a few key important words on a slide, is what you need to be able to do. What I tell people day in, day out, whether they're... One of the things I'm really amazing at is presenting, it turns out, right? And that's making decks and talking. And all I'm doing is abstracting stuff down. That's one of my good skills, is that abstraction, that ability to explain complex things in simple ways. Um, you've got to be able to do that. Um, what was I going with this? Um, you have to be able to take your research findings and present them in a way that is engaging to your audience and communicates the key findings in the shortest or most optimal way. Uh, that in turn makes you look amazing. It makes the team look amazing. It just, it's what transforms the company. One of the things that UX is so amazing at is trans the real transformation. The, uh, and that transformation is movement or towards user centricity and that's Debbie's whole thing. Um, but you need good looking assets or easy to easy, easy to consume assets are kind of like your weapons for doing that. Right. All the activity, all the brilliant strategic, all the hard ass tactical work that you're going to do won't mean anything if you can't c communicate it and effectively politic it, convince it. You know what I mean? Negotiate it, sell it effectively. And you have to have good looking stuff. A creative director told me. Eight years ago, people buy with their eyes. And that's such amazing advice. Yeah, um, Trina's recommending articulating design decisions, but that's more verbal than visual presentations. Um, I, I think this is just a skill that comes uh, over time. I am not a great visual uh, designer. I tend to make pretty simple PowerPoints, but to me, it, it's hopefully more about the information that I'm delivering. Um, only my, my visual designer friends have told me my PowerPoint templates were a little sad. My clients have never said, hey, this PowerPoint template is a little sad. They were pretty focused on the information I was giving them. So, uh, Ralita, I can't think of any particular course or book or thing. Nick? Yeah, really, basically, the secret is, if you look at any of my conference presentations, that's exactly the same style I do at a show and tell or a town hall or at a demo internally. It's basically big font size, not a lot of text per slide. That's the that's your North Star, okay? If people, the minute you see any kind of prose or paragraph, it's too wordy. People aren't looking at it, they're turned off. They're seeing text, they're seeing effort. That's, they don't see it, they're blind to it. They won't read it unless they're really bored and they're probably on their phones anyway. Um, the point is, is um, you don't need a book or a course to do that. You might need an example of it, in which case, like I say, look at mine, look at my, any of my YouTube presentations. You'll see I'm going quite quickly per slide, 
and each slide has only got a few bits on it so that the person reads it goes oh yeah and then carries on with the story that's the storytelling aspect storytelling aspect again right so you're telling a story and you're telling it in short bite-sized chunks without a lot of cognitive load or effort basically that's that's the secret to it any book will tell you that and just take your money for it yeah and my policy on slides is i try to figure out whether or not people are going to try to read the deck later if they're going to read the deck later i've got to put some words on the screen and i've got to give them at least my key points that i'm trying to give them if this is one of my conference talks and um my slides don't have like the top 10 things you need to know about thing um i usually just put a big picture on the screen and i speak to it but I think, and I think that that does engage the audience more because they're not looking at the slide, they're hopefully listening to you. But I think when it comes to research stuff, people tend to look at decks later. And so I can't just have a giant picture of a person looking at a wall of sticky notes. You know, I can't have a stock photo. I'm going to have to give you some of the, the key takeaways or, or insights. So I think it's really just about uh, balancing that and remembering that people might look at these later, but they, they probably don't want slides full of words. I'd probably rather have more slides than fewer, where each slide was simple and easy to go through. Um, another tip is uh, sometimes when I'm doing these decks for companies, um, I've got my slide template uh, has a couple of different colors in my scheme. And a, any slide that is kind of my yellowy orange color uh, from my logo is an action slide. So it's like, here's something I'm suggesting to you. Here's something you need to do. Here's something you should look at changing. And that way, if anybody's blowing through my deck later and they just want to know what they should do differently, they can just jump to all of the orange slides. So there's an well, idea there too. What I'll do for you maybe for next time, for next month's session, I'll dig out one of my previous presentations that I, I'm allowed to share, uh, or I'll blank it out so that I can share it. And I'll just show you one of my in-house presentations uh, for research findings. Um, because what I tend to do is I pull my user needs out and put them in a big colored box with a little tab on it that says user need, you know, or pain point, and just make it nice. You know what I'm saying? Um, the user need itself might be quite dry, but once you kind of like design it up a little bit, I and mean, we're not talking anything fancy, I'm talking about a rectangle with a tab on it and some text. It's nothing rocket science, you know? Um, it, it does an amazing job of, I make the user need the, the star, right? It, it, it's, it's the front and center of my deck is, is, is the user needs that come through. So you design them similarly, job done. Well, Alex says, that would be incredible, thank you. Um, okay, we have three questions left, and one I think came from Holly, who asks, thoughts on how best to structure or place a UX team? Centralized, decentralized, etc. <laughs> I defer to chapter 19 of the Delta CX. Is it no customers, no use suck? Yes, yeah, it says Sorry. customers, no use suck. Uh, no, Nick, do you want to answer that one first? I'm going to go with it depends. <laughs> um, it depends on the on the place. It depends on which what you're asking me. Give me an example, and I'll give you an an, an answer. Um, otherwise, how long is a piece of string? Yeah, and the question was probably asked a half hour ago, so I don't know if Holly is still here. Um, okay. So uh, I apologize there. We, we have people waiting for us, lined up around the block. Um, so uh, as for, for this, I probably do tend to recommend against the internal agency model. I've just found in some of the places where I've worked that when UX was somebody you borrow here and there, um, they uh, sometimes felt like they didn't need you, you know, ah, we can do that, we don't need that person. They couldn't wait to cut you you because this was a line item of the budget that nobody wanted to deal with. And so I have found that the internal agency model, while common, especially when the UX team is too small, um, I've found leads to a lot of, of disconnection. Um, and uh, so that's one piece of advice that I have. So I tend to be more about the UX department, and I want to see that UX department um, 
Now, obviously hiring a lot more because we know we have bottlenecks. We know people are overworked. We have so many bottlenecks that we're actually pretending that we need to democratize and let other people do our work even though they're doing it badly and don't know what they're doing. That's how you can tell we're desperate. So solve your bottleneck with hiring and not with, with dilution. Um, and I'm recommending some larger teams because typically UX is being told they're the bottleneck no matter where we go and what we do. You assign us to the agile team, they say, well, that's, there's not enough. Debbie's not working fast enough. Okay, what about two of us? You know, what about three of us? So I'm trying to push for larger uh, UX teams to be assigned to agile, scrum, or project teams. Um, people are scared of that. They think that's weird. They think that's expensive. And I say, well, you know, it's more expensive for us to be the bottleneck. It's more expensive for us to not get good work done. So I, I do have a lot of thoughts on designing teams. It's chapter 19 in my new Customers Know You Suck book. Um, you can get it on Amazon. You can also get it for as little as $1 on my uh, deltacx.media new website um, with the digital version. So you can download it for as little as a dollar. Hopefully it's worth that. Um, let's see. Uh, Solomon says, at a tech company with a SaaS B2C product with a design team of eight people with various skills. Um, yeah, they, that's the problem. That's already too few UX people at an entire SaaS company. You're going to have to prioritize and decide where you're going to focus those UX people. The mistake a lot of people make is they say, well, you know, let's take Solomon and put him on four projects. Now you have four unhappy teams. You know, if you put Solomon on one team and really allocate him there and he does an amazing job, you have three unhappy teams who don't have a UX resource, but that other one that does, and especially if Solomon's really de dedicated and he's putting in 30, 40 hours a week just for that one team and doing amazing stuff, that's the case study to say, and we need three more Solomons. So I don't like seeing people, you know, even Agile says, that we don't like to see people allocated to multiple teams. Get your UX person dedicated here. And I say, great, I'd love to be. I don't want to be juggling four projects. I want to focus on one and do it really well. It's hard enough to do a UX project really well without being responsible to do four UX projects really well in a small time frame. So um, this is obviously too short an answer. We are running out of time, but those are um, some of my thoughts. And also, ultimately, I want to see UX as its own branch in the org. I don't want to see it under product, not under engineering, not under marketing. I want to see it be its own branch. Nick, anything to add? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to become its own branch either. It's going to become a, a branch of design. I'm calling it experience. You can call it design. As long as it's got its own branch, I'm not going to fight over what it is. Solomon wrote a bunch of comments earlier, and I think they were a question, so I put them together. Let's see what they say. What does it mean to design something? I think people assume only the visual and aesthetic aspects of design and it's reinforced in education. Education programs emphasize being ready for hire with companies with narrowly and incorrectly defined job descriptions for UX designer. And most leadership at today's companies don't understand that. But then should they? Should we expect company leadership to understand the intricate details of interaction design, especially if they leave all hiring and candidate evaluation to HR reps? Ooh, I've got an answer. Nick, there was a lot there. What, thoughts? Yeah. Huh. There was too much there for me to process. But yeah, it's a multi-tiered, it's a multi-level problem. The people hiring don't know what they're hiring for generally, or at least the, the first levels of filters. Should we expect senior manage, management to understand the intricacies of interaction design? No. And even if we did, it's unrealistic. Um, I don't know where to go. Maybe I'll just gather my thoughts and let you go for it. Okay. Um, so some of the thoughts, that, there's obviously 12,000 questions rolled into one here, so I apologize for the, uh, the onslaught. But one of the things that jumps out at me about this uh, multiverse question is I do expect at least low-level leadership to know what UX is. If you have managers, directors, heads, and you are opening UX jobs, 
I freaking expect you to know what UX is. If you are opening UX jobs and, you, and somebody doesn't understand what UX is, that's going to be a shitty job. That's going to be bad to work there. People are going to constantly question your value or why you're there or why they're paying you. I, I'm, the C level may not totally get UX. I get that. But I do expect lower level people to get it. I expect an engineering lead to know what a UX designer does. I don't want them to do UX design work, but we keep showing up on teams and cross-functional teams and the PO doesn't understand what we do. The engineering lead doesn't understand what we do. This is ridiculous. Nobody shows up onto a team at work and says, hi, I'm going to do the QA and everybody goes, what's that? Or, you know, somebody goes, hi, I'm the QA person and the marketer goes, I thought I was the QA person. It doesn't make sense that we keep showing up to jobs and departments and teams when people do not know what we do. So will the highest level of the company get it? No, they may not know what's happening with all of the peons, but I expect my teammates, coworkers, and lower level management strata to know what I do. You should not have a job open for me if you don't know what I do. If you can't figure out what I do and you're not sure if you need what I do, please don't even open the job because these jobs suck. So that's what I would say to that. Nick. Uh, yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got, I mean, I've been a freelancer for too long, so my mentality is probably like, I don't really care as much. Just get out of my way and let me do my job. I mean, I don't understand what every QA person does. I've got an understanding of the testing stuff, you know what I mean? And I've got a pretty idea. But when they talk about test harness and all the stuff that they do, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I don't understand any of that stuff. And I don't, I don't really need to. Um, I don't find it that interesting. It's not my job. It's somebody else's job. And they're very far down the line to me, pretty much. Um, and if they think that I'm the weird research or design guy, that's largely okay. It's just, like I said, just... Hold your opinions, because <laughs> that is the, 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 the when they start saying, well, I think our users need. That's the bigger problem. It's like, well, then you clearly don't know what I do. Um, but other than that, I just like the space to be able to do what I can do. You see what I mean? It's, that's more important generally. That, that's just me. I'm a freelancer, though. It's, a diff it's probably a different mindset. Yeah, and Holly says, when people who don't know what UX is do the hiring, they hire the visual-focused people who did a UX boot camp short course, and the snowball continues. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, that's why a couple of two years ago, I did a uh, an online course that's still completely free. It's called Attracting and Retaining CX and UX Talent. It is available at deltacx.link slash HR dash training because I was trying to train HR and hiring managers to better recognize good UX candidates and make better job descriptions. Um, good luck to me on that. Um, okay, so we've got our last question for today, and then we got to get out of here. I've got more calls and work coming up today. Um, so this was a, a question that was in response to a lot of uh, chat that was happening in, in the uh, live chat, and someone said, related to the questions and comments around getting pushback and poor management, how do you decide whether it's better to walk away? What are some of the red flags that things won't change? Yeah, it's things don't change. It's that, is it anything going to change or is this the, the, traje the trajectory, you know? Um, often there are times, though, you'll have red flags and you can't leave immediately because the world doesn't work that way. You, you know, you, you're going to try and find another job, all of that stuff. And you'll muscle through it um, and there'll be another red flag. For me, it takes a number of red flags, real genuine red flags, before... I can't read it. What does it say? Katrina said, when people introduce you as the person who makes things pretty. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, no, that's that's a good time to walk out the door. <laughs> you don't appreciate or love me or have any clue what I do at that point. <laughs> so cheers and bye-bye. Um, sorry, where were we? I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Um, uh, what's a red flag that things aren't going to change and you need to go? Um 
it's making the same mistakes when I'm being in a permanent role. It's been a case of um, if you're feeling like too much of a passenger, you know what I mean? If you're a passenger in the car and that car keeps jumping over road bumps at speed or, you know, uh, or crashing, uh, it's not a car that's going to take you where you want to go or it's not going to be a good experience whilst you're in that car. So it's probably time to change car. <laughs> um, there are other times where it's a really wild ride, you know, but you're learning tons because you're going through some crazy territory, right? Um, it's red flags and, and leaving companies is a tough call because there's so many different factors to it. Sometimes you've got to tough it out because the education is worth it. Uh, the other times, you know, there's maybe cultural or bigoted or terrible bad shit going on where you just can't be there. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, but from a UX profession or a practice point of view, if you're not getting the experience that you need or want, um, it's time to move. It's time to then move on again to get the experience that you need. And that's what this is about. It's about exposure to different kinds of experiences within the UX world, whether it's research or design or both, whatever your, your bag is. Um, be careful. There are lots of people out there who go, I've been doing UX for 10 years, but they've only done it at two places. So again, you've got to be like, well, you know UX in two places. That's okay, but there's a really big, wide UX world out there, and you probably don't have... You might come unstuck quite quickly because there's a lot of new out there that you haven't got experience of, right? So there is a happy medium between getting variety of the kind of work and sticking stuff out to be able to get the good learning. And I guess only you or anybody else can actually know that personally. Um, don't, don't let anyone disrespect you or your profession, but sometimes you've got to grind through it. I don't know that more. That, that's all I can really go with, I think. Yeah, thanks. And Ana Lucia, Lucia is talking about being harassed and bullied by her bosses. Yeah, um, no, that's a, yeah Trina out. says, awesome analogy, Dr. Nick, when you feel like a passenger, agree with the, when things don't change in spite of your variety of efforts to educate management. So I've been writing a list of things that I would look for um, if, uh, you know, that, that I would look for. Um, the first is I would roll out my new pyramid and I would say, if you see anything at the bottom of this pyramid, like threats, character attacks, gaslighting, racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, if you are seeing that crap, you probably need to go. Now, again, we know people need to put food on the table. Sometimes you can't just walk out of a job. You know, in an economy, in a market like this, if you walk out of a job, you might be looking for a job for a year. So you sometimes you, you feel stuck. And uh, But if you're talking about what's a red flag that things are probably not going to get better, I would probably uh, start with that. Um, uh, Noisy Doll says, uh, LMAO, I saw you throw down the pyramid in the LinkedIn thread this morning and I was like, yes. Yeah, some guy said a bunch of uh, really bullshitty things and I said, find yourself on this pyramid and I posted the pyramid. Um, yeah, because he was like, oh, all of you very few anti-design thinking people in your very tiny boat because you're sad that you're not on a pedestal being admired well and it was it was just like oh my god you're you're absolutely living the bottom of the pyramid sir i will not uh engage with you further um it sounds like that um i'm gonna get a nationality wrong so i won't try but was, his name is igor or ivor the guy that trolled us both pretty heavily six months ago oh that guy no no this what we both blocked him this was somebody else today um okay. yeah i blocked that guy i threw him out of our community that was bad because he showed up and said racist things about darren oh my god like yeah, in 2023 you... like it blows my mind like like go and back then when to like i told him he was being racist he's like i'm not racist there's no racism in romania 
And I was like, oh, right, yeah, right, that right. is wonderful news. I'm so happy to hear it. Good. He said, racism is, is American. And I was like, oh, this is just getting better. So anyway, also on my list of red flags that I made while Nick was talking, if you try to make change and you can't make change for something you think that you should have the authority to make change on. Now, very often we're in a junior job, we're an intern, we're in a mid-level job. We don't have the authority to make change, but we're talking to our managers, we're talking to people and you know maybe that change is absolutely not going to come and you have to decide if you can stay there or not um i also wrote nothing oh go ahead if they promise you stuff if they over promise and under deliver that's a massive red flag it just occurred to me you know in your annual review they'll say yeah yeah we'll send you on training we'll go to conferences we'll get you on your norman thing that uh, and a year later nothing transpires right that's a very wasted year or they're just basically gaslighting you or kind of carroting you or whatever you call that you know um if they if you've got a really good lead or good manager and what they say comes true if it, even if it's hard going stick that shit out <laughs> that seems like a good person unless they're racist um i also wrote down yeah. nothing in portfolio you know some people have come to our tuesday shows and asked questions about this i've lived it as well i worked for two years at macy's.com and i have nothing to put in my portfolio because i spent all of my time trying to talk people out of worse ideas and anything that i tried to design they told me no just rip off what coles is doing and so i don't have anything in my portfolio after working at a job for two years I probably should have left sooner but I liked the people and the projects were interesting they just unfortunately always went nowhere um, which I feel comfortable talking about now because this was six years ago now so this is old news and maybe Macy's is better but when I was there I was there for two years and I have nothing to put in my portfolio and some of you have come to me and said I'm at these jobs I don't even think I'm doing UX work I'm just taking orders it's all visual design how am I ever going to get my next job? Nothing's going to go in my portfolio. And I think that's when you have to think about moving if you can. Nick. Yeah, that, that whole thing was a big deal in 2013, 2015, just before the gold rush. Um, that was a big deal. I was, I was victim to it too. That, you'd go for six months without doing a research project. So that you'd be there wireframing. There was a term that was used at the time called the wireframe monkey because that's what you did all day every day, which is wireframing. There was no research, they cut that bit out, just go straight to the wireframing bit, make me a prototype and give it to the devs, basically. And that's what preceded the badness. Um, why am I saying that, Deb? Who can say? Uh, yeah, who can say, it's gone. <laughs> all part um, of the magic history tour that's in here. Um, it always makes me think of Monty Python's Life of Brian, where the guy goes, I think you finished. When the, yeah, guy, yeah, when the guy was in the middle of talking. <laughs> um, I, I so forgot my point. It's been a hell of a long day. And as I said, I did an information architecture this afternoon that would scare most people. Well, like, I've got one so more on my list and, and we're super over time. But it, another thing that's a super red flag for me, which may not be redeemable, is when your manager doesn't understand you or support you. Obviously, if your manager is actively against you, racist, abusive, bullying, gaslighting, that's on a whole other category, that is not acceptable. But a manager who doesn't understand why you need time, need tools, need resources, need budget, need whatever, and they don't support you in the things you need, um, that I find usually doesn't get better unless they get you a different manager, unless you can get moved to a different team. That's usually a red flag of you probably can't stay here if you can't even, if your own manager doesn't support you. Do you know what though? Be your own manager in, in this regard. And when I say go rogue, that's what I kind of mean. Be your own manager. You're going to have a line manager because you do. That's the nature of the world. A lot of them aren't very good. That's the fact. Okay. Let's just call that one straight out. But that shouldn't get in the way of your professional development, right? You're your own coach in that regard or your own learning and development boss. Um, actively ask them for stuff, you know, set your stuff out. Don't wait for it to come to you. Um, actively ask for the training or ask to get a senior or a lead on the team, ask to be involved in the interviews, all that kind of stuff. Um, bring the good stuff to you. But if you can't get it, move on. That, because it's a learning journey. Debbie's learning, I'm learning, Darren's learning, Larry Marine is learning. Everybody is learning. Uh, we're still on a learning journey. 
the minute you, your learning journey stops, you're going to be cut. You, you'll, you'll lose confidence. <laughs> you'll lose confidence and you'll lose confidence in a, in these dangerous waters. So just um, keep the learning happening and make sure either you bring the learning to you or go if your life circumstance allows you to kind of transfer jobs and find a better environment to learn in. Or, or more importantly, people to learn from. I've got to say, learning from people is better than learning from books and stuff generally, right? Like mentorship, apprenticeship type stuff. That's generally speaking, a better way of learning and like i said debbie and i and everybody else we learn that way ah the good old days um holly commented love that advice after i decided to stop asking for permission i got more done in four months than the previous 12. hell yes it can happen Listen, if you're doing good work no one cares that there was no permission right obviously law ethics morals all that stuff are in play but go rogue Go rogue for good and it, it, and it'll be fine. But just go rogue and do it in a bad way or a selfish way or a, it, you'll, you'll get fired and bad things will happen and don't point, don't, don't reference me ever. <laughs> uh, well, Nick, thank you so much for staying uh, a zillion hours here to answer people's questions and help them out and, and mass mentor people. Um, please remind everybody where they can find you and connect with you. I'm on LinkedIn. That's where I choose to live. Um, and I'm getting noisier and noisier by the day because that's it. So you can find me there. I'm not as responsive as I need to be on messages. So if you've got a question, please ask it briefly. Uh, I do get a lot of essays and they're not, I just, I can't do that. I don't have the time. Uh, otherwise, yeah, please uh, get involved with the, with the discussions on LinkedIn. Um, Debbie, Darren, myself, Larry, follow us all uh, and get involved more and more importantly. This isn't about us being rock stars. This is about getting the industry back on track. And that includes you. Well said, sir. Yes. And just a quick reminder of some stuff coming up in the Delta CX calendar, which you can find at deltacx.com slash links. Tomorrow is Customers Know You Suck Book Club. We're going to be talking about Chapter 8, Metrics. Um, if you haven't read it, you're welcome there. If you haven't read the book at all, you're welcome there. If you've read Chapter 8, you are extra welcome there. So it's no charge. It's in Google Meet, and you can find uh, the link there. Thursday is a special show by request. Some people ask asked me to show some of the slides I've been working on that show some of the math you can do around the value of UX, the value of research and researchers. I'm going to show you those slides that I've been working on and hopefully this will help somebody at their job. Friday is going to be practicing critical thinking. In addition to the handful of things you've sent in, we're also going to have a kind of tough conversation about some fireworks we've had over in our Slack community um, around uh, language. Nick was aware of this from a private message I sent him. Um, I'd like to, to open that conversation up for some critical thinking. Um, and next week, Monday is Think Out Loud. Tuesday is Office Hours Ask Me Anything, Wednesday Book Club. And um, next Friday, the 24th, I'm going to read that MIT article that just came out, super pooping on design thinking. So Friday, the 24th, will be a special added extra edition of the show where, uh, for once, I'm not reading my own article. I'm reading somebody else's article. But holy cats, they super pooped on uh, design thinking. And uh, I would love for us to hear that one out loud and talk about what might what that might mean and what's coming next because you know something's coming next so um go ahead we're nearly at the point that ux ui and design thinking can be binned for good and carry on like they served their they, they were vehicles they they served a, a kind of clandestine purpose but they we're nearly I, I feel i feel like we're so close to getting user centricity back on the table but there's a fight ahead of us. But once we get that back on the table, all that stuff can go away and we can actually focus on UX rather than what is UX, and why it isn't design thinking and all the other stupid things we waste our time on. And all the design by committee workshopping with no accountability. Mm -mm -mm. All right, to be continued, thanks again to everybody for doing the marathon version with us, which we do once a month with Dr. Nick, the second Tuesday of each month. So you can catch him again the second Tuesday of March. He'll be back here. And uh, But meanwhile, I'm here every Tuesday asking, uh, answering your questions. If you want to send them in ahead of time, deltacx.com slash links. Everybody be well. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Nick.
customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit DeltaCX.com to learn why we are 